like to focus on Canada versus the U.S. a little bit because there was a big deal made about the RCC and the fact that there was a lot of coordination between the U.S. and Canada. Now, when I took economics in college, my economics professor would always talk about the bird's eye view and the worm's eye view. From the bird's eye view, things look really good, right? Building blocks are pretty much the same. Some of the additional hazards that were added are all there. It's all good. But from the worm's eye view, you start to see little things that make life a little bit difficult. Because now you've got to make a decision if you want to try and have one SDS and label going between the two countries, right? Um, disclosure on the SDS is the same for both. It's required that all ingredients which are classified as hazardous and present above their concentration or cutoff limits be disclosed. The only reason that I bring this up is because there was a letter of interpretation that came out on this as well. So the question was, if you have classified your mixture using mixture data, so let's say you've tested it and it's not skin corrosive. It's not skin corrosive, not skin irritant, nothing. But you still have components which are above the cutoff and are classified as skin corrosion irritation, those still need to be disclosed in section three. So there's no matching between your hazards in section two and your disclosure in section three. It's simply cut off. Um, carcinogen category two and the label for Canada, if you've got a, a, a category one or two carcinogen, you have to have that on the label if it's above 0.1%, label and SDS. In the US, it's a little bit different. You can see in the last paragraph that for a category two that's between 0.1% and 1%, you're not required to have a label. This is optional for that. So again, if you're going to be sending in one label between Canada and the US, you, know, you may have to do more in the US than you might like because you'll have to meet the Canadian regulations. Um, differences in HNOCs for Canada, they divided them up between health and physical. So you've got, it's not just one bucket, you've got two buckets here. They've all been assigned to category one. Um, they are required to be on the label. They've automatically been assigned a signal word of danger and then companies must define the hazard and precautionary statements for that HNOC. Um, and they are considered to be a part of the actual hazard classification so they should be included with the rest of the GHS hazards on the SDS. OSHA, we have a single definition. It's just an HNOC. We don't care if it's physical or health. They are not required to be on the label, though. Okay, so this is kind of interesting because some of these hazards could be very hazardous, right? But they're not requiring that you warn for those on the label, but that conflicts, again, a little bit with what we have for Canada. Now, this one, there was a letter of interpretation that came out that said OSHA, um, that HNOCs should have a single signal word assigned on the label. Now, HNOCs are not required, or sorry, on the SDS, they're not, re HNOCs are not required to be on the label, so you wouldn't have to do it there, but they're saying on the SDS, you should put a signal word. This is kind of strange, because if you don't then put your HNOC information on your label, you could have a signal word on your SDS and nothing on your label, right? And that's likely to cause confusion, and that won't make anybody happy. Um, I've had discussions with people about this who think this is OSHA trying to legislate through a letter of interpretation, and they don't like that. So there are people out there who are saying this should be thrown out because they said we don't have to do the HNOCs um, on the label, and the signal word is a label element. So for Mexico, we have the mandatory standard, the voluntary standard, and the GHS. Or I should have said the UN GHS, maybe. Um, so as we learned on Tuesday, we have the mandatory standard, which is the NOM, um, so you can use Rev3 or above, but the, in, within the um, document itself, it does have tables which have the codes for the H&P phrases, so that gives you an indication of the building blocks that they accepted, right? Those building blocks do match up with um, revision four, so, so that's interesting. The other part is it did not contain the um, hazard statements for the environmental hazards which is interesting because the NMX standard did have the environmental hazards in there. So I would still expect them to be used because it's in the NMX and the NMX is referred to in the NOM, but it's an interpretation. So we talked a bit about Brazil. Uh, we've got the four standards and we know that the classification one has not been updated. So the labeling in SDS look to be based on revision four. So what happens with hazard classes that have been added to the UN um, between the, the classification standard and the, the updated labeling in SDS. 
Well, within the labeling standard, they did add a provision stating that if, um, for labeling provisions that do not have criteria defined in the current classification, so this is the NBR 14725-2, the classification criteria in the fourth revision of the GHS can be used. So this is indicating that you can use the REV4 classification scheme for things like um, chemically unstable flammable gases A and B, um, aerosols category three. Um, the difference here really is around when the product is not classified, you still have to have a label for it that has a product identifier, and it has to state that it's not classified according to 14725-2. And then if you have any um, recommended precautions, you should add those as well. When you have a range, your classification in section two must be aligned with the upper end of the range in three. Okay, so you've got to be careful if you're putting ranges in to mask your exact concentration values that your classification matches up with what's in that um, upper level of the range. Okay, Chile, um, they updated their SDS standard, um, and in it, they referenced both their current classification standard and the GHS. And so depending on which one you're classifying by, it gave information on the information you should output on the SDS. Okay.